Hi, I'm Paul Kogan from GK Tuition, and in this video I want to talk to you about inferential statistics. Now the question that I've chosen to go through here is 2015 paper 2 question 2. In the first part of this question, we're told that a survey of 100 shoppers has taken place, and that the average, so these shoppers all went to the supermarket on Saturday. And the, the mean amount spent by these shoppers was 90 euro and 45 cent, and that the standard deviation was 20 euro and 73 cent. We're asked to find a 95% confidence interval for the average amount spent in the supermarket that Saturday. Okay, so let me just talk you through this. So n always represents the number of people in my survey. So I surveyed 100 people, n is clearly 100. I think sometimes people struggle with their x bar. X bar is your sample mean. So I, my, I took a sample of 100 people and the average amount that those 100 people spent was 90 euro and 45 cent. Don't mix up X bar with mu. Mu is the population mean. If I surveyed every single person who went to the supermarket that Saturday and got their average spend, that would be mu. That would be the average of the population. Every single person in the population. But obviously in this case it was impractical to survey everyone, so they just took a small sample of 100 people. Now when you're asked to do a confidence interval, you should be aware that there's two confidence intervals on a Leave Insert Higher Level course. You need to ask yourself, are you using the standard error of the mean or are you using the standard error of the proportion? In this case it should be quite clear, you've been given a sample mean, you've been given a standard deviation, and you've been given an N. Which means there's no reference to proportion or percentage, so you should recognize that you're using the standard error of the mean. Once you've recognized that, we have a formula for our confidence interval. A 95% confidence interval using the standard error of the mean is x bar, or in other words, the result of my sample, plus or minus 1.96 times the standard error of the mean, which is sigma over the square root of n. Okay, so the result of my sample was 90 euro and 45 cent. Okay, plus or minus 1.96. The 1.96 allows me to be 95% confident about my results. And my sigma in this case was 20.73, and the square root of n is this, in this case is the square root of 100. So if we just continue on, I've got 90.45 plus or minus 4.06308. Okay, and it's at this stage I think it's very important you understand what this figure represents. So I surveyed 100 shoppers, and their average was 90 euro and 45 cents. But that average, that's not necessarily the average of every single person who went who who did their shopping that Saturday. Perhaps the 100 people that I surveyed actually spent a little bit more than the average. Or perhaps they spent a little bit less than the average. So this figure does not represent the average of every single person who went who shopped in the supermarket that Saturday. It's just a fairly good indication. It gives me a fairly good idea that they, the, the average of every single person must be somewhere around 90 euro and 45 cents. And this here, my 1.96 times sigma over the square root of n, allows me to calculate the degree to which my results could be wrong. So this allows me, so based on the fact that I've only surveyed 100 people, my average could be out by about 4 euro and 6 cents. I don't know if the 100 people I surveyed spent more than the average or less than the average. So I need to plus or minus this, I need to add it on or subtract it. So in this case my final line is mu, which is the population mean. Mu must lie somewhere between it must be less than 90.45 plus the degree to which I could be wrong. And it must be greater than 90.45 minus the degree to which I could be wrong. So basically you just you add on your degree of error to your results. So my final answer is mu is 94.51 euro. So the average must be less than 94.51 euro but greater than 86.39 euro. So what this represents, this is my 95% confidence interval. So I surveyed 100 people, that gave me an indication of what the average spend of every single person in the supermarket that Saturday was. And based on my calculations, I can be 95% confident 
that if I had surveyed every single person who went to the supermarket that Saturday, there's a 95% chance that the average spend would have been greater than 86.39 and less than 94.51. So my final answer in that case, this is my 95% confidence interval. Okay, so for part B of this question, we're told that the supermarket has claimed the average amount spent by each shopper in the supermarket that Saturday was 94 euro. Now we're asked, based on the survey from the previous part of the question, we're asked to work out, to investigate if this claim is true or not. State your null hypothesis and state your alternative hypothesis. Now for the marking scheme in this case, they actually accepted you could have used your confidence interval from part A, or you could have done it using this formula here. Now when a question says to use a 5% level of significance, I always tell my students to use this formula. Use your one sample t-test from the top of page 35 in your log tables. The question says, use, if the question says to test a 5% level of significance, you should always use this formula. However, in the marking scheme in this case, you got away with using the confidence interval, but it's just a better habit to use this formula. Now I want you to notice, right, so my null hypothesis is what's claimed by the company. The company have claimed that the average of the population was 94 euro. Notice that this is a mu. Mu is the average of the population, or the population mean. The population in this case is every single person who was shopping in the supermarket that Saturday. So they're claiming that the average of all the shoppers was 94 euro. So that's my null hypothesis. And my alternative hypothesis, HA, is that the average is not 94. Or in other words, that it's different from 94. So in this case, if I fill in my values here, my N for my survey, I sampled 100 people. My standard deviation is the same. The result of my sample was 90.45 euro. And the, I want, I'm assuming the population mean is 94. And I want to, I'm going to compare the, the result of my sample to the claim of the company. And I'm going to see, I'm going to investigate if it's true. In order to do that, in order to, do a, to test a 5% level of significance, we're going to use this formula. Once we've identified this, it's relatively straightforward. So I want to work out what is my Z score based on this information. So my sample mean was 90.45, and the mu in this case is 94. And I'm going to divide that by 20.73 over the square root of 100. And if I plug all of this into my calculator, I get minus 1.71. So that's, in, so that's, the, that's all the maths that we needed to do, and now we just need to conclude. But I want to start that, I, I want you to be very thorough in your conclusion here. So what I want to do is wipe off the board, and I want to talk to you about all the different ways we can conclude this question. Okay, so when you're making your conclusion here, I always recommend, I think one of the, mo the clearest way of doing it is to draw a diagram. So you'll notice here that I've sketched a normal curve. So basically just a rough sketch of a normal curve. I always mark in where zero is, mark in minus 1.96 and mark in plus 1.96. If my Z score, if my Z score lies within minus one, between minus 1.96 and plus 1.96, that means I'm going to fail to reject HO. If my Z score is less than minus 1.96 or greater than 1.96, then I'm going to reject it. So this is the rejection zone. So I'd always mark in my three different sections and I'd label them. And then notice in, the pre, in this question, we worked out that Z is minus 1.71. So I've marked in roughly where minus 1.71 is, and I've marked that that's my Z. Clearly, it's in my fail to reject HO zone. So then to explain that mathematically, I'd say that Z is between minus 1.96 and plus 1.96. So therefore, I fail to reject HO. Okay, so for the final part of this question, we're asked to find the p-value for the test we performed in part B. The p-value represents the proportion of figures more extreme than our result. So you'll notice that I've shaded in the proportion of figures less than minus 1.71. So the first thing I want to do is find the, pro the, pr the probability that z is less than minus 1.71 you need to recognize you can't, there's no negative Z scores in my maths tables. So I can't read this. I can't read this straight off my maths tables. So I want to get rid of the negative sign here. And in order to do that, I need to change my inequality and change this sign. The, pr the probability Z is less than minus 1.71 is the same as 
the probability that z is greater than 1.71. Or in other words, the proportion of figures less than that is the same as the proportion of figures greater than that. Now, you can't read greater than off your log tables. So rather than getting the probability z is greater than 1.71, you can get 1 minus the probability z is less than 1.71. Now, you should recognize that I can read this straight off my log tables. Probability less than a positive value, I'm happy out. So I can read the probability that z is less than 1.71 off my log tables. And if you do that, you get 0 0.9564. So I've worked out that the proportion of figures less than minus 1.71 is 0 0.0436. Okay, but when we're getting the p-value, we need to get the proportion of figures less than minus 1.71, but also the figures that are greater than plus 1.71, because these figures are more extreme than our value as well. So I need to get the tail on the left and also the tail on the right. Luckily for us, we've already worked this out, and this is a perfectly symmetrical graph. So if, point zero, if the proportion that is less than this is 0 0.0436, to get these two together, all I need to do is multiply by 2. So I just need to multiply this by 2, which means that my p-value is 0 0.0872. Okay, so that's my p-value. So I've worked out that my p-value is equal to 0 0.0872. Now, let's just go up to the top and we'll conclude this one. Okay, so I always tell my students to go for overkill when you're concluding these statistics questions. I've worked out that my p-value is 0 0.0872. You should always refer, ref, refer to this when you're concluding. Because p is greater than 0 0.05, that means I fail to reject HO. Or in other words, because more than 5% of the figures are more extreme than my Z score, I'm gonna to fail to reject HO because that means it's within my 95% confidence interval. So essentially, this is just another way of this is just another way of concluding what I did in part B. If your p-value is greater than 0 0.05, you're gonna to fail to reject HO. If your p-value is less than 0 0.05, you would reject HO. So I've just said, right, I failed to reject HO, the mean amount spent the mean amount spent by shoppers on Saturday could be 94 euro. So I hope this video made sense. If there's anything you're unsure of there, then just let me know in class during the week and I'll try and clarify it for you.